to Treasury Inheritance Ministry. I'm Yosef Ben Avram. And it's good to be back again with you for all new teaching that I've entitled, I Am Your Great Reward. And we're going to be speaking about being people who move towards becoming the sons and daughters of righteousness, but also towards a people of inheritance. And I believe, brothers and sisters, that there is a great message that the Father wants us to understand at this time that we are alive in. And many people are understanding it, but they are not applying it to their lives. Others are listening, but they are absolutely, definitely not walking in the ways that the Father wants. So we need to be of those that the Father says, Blessed is he who has eyes to see and ears to hear. He's looking for people of obedience. He's looking for people that listen, but also apply what he is saying to their lives. So brothers and sisters, before we start, let's pray. Abba Father, we want to thank you and give you all the praise and all the adoration. Father, we thank you in the name of Yeshua for this opportunity that we have, that we can come together and just fellowship around your word. Father, I want to pray in Yeshua's name that every single person that will come and listen to this teaching, Father, I pray in Yeshua's name that they will receive, Father, that they will have hearts to receive and a mind to perceive too, Father, what you are saying to them at this time. Father, we thank you that we are able to share these things, Father, far and wide, and that people are able to hear it. I pray, Father, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Father, that you will bless them, that you will raise up a holy, a righteous remnant in this generation, a people for your own purpose, a people, Father, who are willing to count the cost and who are willing, Father, to restore the very manifest presence of their King upon this earth. Father, we thank you and we bless you for this time. In the wonderful name of Yeshua, we pray. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, if you have your Bible with you, I'd like you to turn with me to the book of Genesis, Bereshit, chapter 15. And we're going to be reading from verse 1. Now, I like to read it in a few different translations for you because I believe that if we do that, that we will get a deeper understanding of what Yahweh is saying to Abram at this very moment. And it says the following in verse 1. It says, After these things, the word of Yahweh came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Now, that was out of the New King James Version. But in the Scriptures Version, it reads in the following way. And it says, After these events, the word of Yahweh came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. And your reward is exceedingly great. I like the New King James Version because it helps us to understand that Yahweh is Abram's exceedingly great reward. Not only that, but he is also his shield. Now the question is that we need to understand what Yahweh is actually saying. And you know, this is such an amazing scripture because Yahweh says to Abram, Do not be afraid, for he is his shield. And not only that, but he is also his exceedingly great reward. Not just great reward he's exceedingly great reward brothers and sisters do you see what our father is saying to him you know so often we read the scriptures but do we really actually truly understand what Yahweh is saying to us you know for a long time now we've been saying that our father is doing a new thing and he himself told us to forget the former things and to look to the new thing that he himself would do not only in us but among us You see, brothers and sisters, it has to start within us first if we are wanting to see our communities change, the places where we worship and others change. It has to start within us first. In Isaiah chapter 43, verse 18 to 21, it says the following. It says, forget the former things. Forget about them. Do not dwell on the past. Don't look to the old thing. But see, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you perceive it? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. Hallelujah. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I, Yahweh himself, he provides water in the desert and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people. What people? His chosen people. The people that he formed for myself. In other words, the people of his presence the people of his glory the people that he formed for himself to do what to worship him so that they may proclaim what his praises so that the world may know that he is the one true elohim yahweh is looking for such a man such a woman 
He's looking for somebody who will stand up in this wicked generation for his righteousness through whom he can reveal his presence to the world. But like we have said in many, many teachings that have gone previously on this channel, unfortunately there are many that are still holding onto the old thing. You know, I cannot understand why people choose to set up camp in the places where they seem to be comfortable. And you know, these places where, the, where, the, where they seem to be so comfortable, they are also places of no water, no ruach, no true zeal, no true spirit. You know, they speak of the things of Abba, but they seem to refuse to do more than just wait and see. They seem to sit back and wait and see and, and see what Yahweh will do instead of getting busy with the Father's business. And the fact of the matter is, I believe that there are many people today that have lost their zeal. They have lost their passion as well as lost the truth. You know, we can be doing a lot of things. And I've said this many, many times. We can be doing a lot of things. But in the end, all that we are doing can be out of sync with Yeshua. The good way is not the God way. And so many times we think that what we're doing is good, but it is not what the Father has put in front of us. It is not His divine will and purpose for our lives. It is what we think is good. It's what we think we should be doing. It's what our friends have told us we should be doing. But did they actually go and seek what the Father wanted us to be doing? You know, the biggest problem today in the body of Messiah is the reasons, the very reason why people serve Yeshua. The different reasons why we do what we do. And you know, for some, they do it out of a deep heart devotion. And I believe that that devotion is driven by a passion which is actually based on true love. Love for Yahweh. Love for Yeshua. And these kind of people, I believe, have had a true life-changing experience. They have had, like, like Paul on the road to Damascus, where he fell off. It is, it is exactly like that, where they have had a life-changing experience. And I believe that they have also, these kind of people, they have willingly given everything over to Yeshua. They desire to serve Him in spirit and in truth. Yet for others, they seem to serve Yeshua out of love too. But when you look at their lives, you come to see that they're always looking for what they can benefit, what they can gain out of the relationship. And they seem to be wanting praise, praises of men or praises from others so that they can really feel accepted. It's got to do with the acceptance. And many of these people suffer with rejection. And you know, brothers and sisters, I have stated over and over that there are many illegitimate children in the kingdom of Yeshua. I'm not talking about an orphan spirit. I'm talking about illegitimate children. Children who do not, do not walk in the obedience that the Father has placed in front of them. And the book of Hebrews, as we have said over and over, talks about illegitimate children. Because we haven't followed in the ways of Yahweh, we become illegitimate. We are no longer able to receive the, 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 what is the word I'm looking for? The inheritance that the Father has for us. And there are many illegitimate children in the kingdom of Yeshua. And these people, brothers and sisters, unfortunately, they walk around and they have no idea who they really are. And because of this, they are wandering around and they're trying to find meaning to their lives in every single thing that they do. And they'll fill it with all kinds of religious garbage. And the truth is that if you do this, in the end, we miss the point of what Yeshua is wanting from us. That He just wants us to love Him and He wants to love us. He wants us to be true children of the kingdom that are not illegitimate but are legitimate. Legitimate heirs of His kingdom. Sons and daughters of righteousness. Those who understand the cost of being a true disciple as well as being a true priest. That's what He wants. He wants you to understand what it really means to be a priest of righteousness. What does the word Melchizedek really mean to you? What does it actually mean to be a priest of righteousness? We're going to look at that as we go on in this teaching. Now, for a long time, I've spoken about maturity and how important it is that we mature into the children that Yeshua wants us to be. You see, we need to mature so that we can overcome. Because as a child, it is difficult to overcome. But as a son, as a daughter of righteousness, as one that has matured, it becomes easier because we have grown up. You know, I've spoken about the importance of covenant so many times in all the teachings. And I've spoken about how covenant relates to our maturing process. 
You know, I spoke about three main covenants and how I felt that they related, each one of these related to the process that each believer has to go through in this life in order for them to become a mature person, to become a true son or, or daughter of righteousness, one who understands what Abba wants from them. And we said that each one of these covenants is progressive, that we need to continue to walk in each one of them. And then finally, that's when we become the bride. If we miss one of these covenants or we miss one of these steps, brothers and sisters, we run the risk of becoming illegitimate children in the kingdom of Yahweh. And like I said, we also spoke about and we discussed the fact that each covenant represents a period of time. Now, if you haven't listened to the covenant series and you're listening to this teaching right now, I urge you to pause it and go and listen to the four-part teaching on covenants. You'll find it on the, on the channel and, and if you scroll down, it will be there. Now, for example, I said that the blood covenant represents salvation or it represented a time period which we could call the time of the church, the time where people were getting saved. People were going to church and they were receiving from the Father and they were getting saved. And then we took it a step further to explain that the Mosaic covenant represented the time of the Torah and the working of the Torah movement or the Messianic faith. But that doesn't mean, brothers and sisters, as we progress into the understanding of what the Torah means to us and how to apply it to our lives, that we forgot about our salvation experience. And unfortunately today, many, many people within the Torah movement have forgotten about their salvation experience. They need to be of those that cry out to Abba Father and say, renew in me the, the, the clean, give unto me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. We, we, we really need to cry out and, and say those things. We need to remember how it was when we first got saved, how His blood atoned for our sins, how His blood set us free, how His blood reconciled us to the Father. Now that we have been redeemed by the precious blood, not by things of this world, but by the precious blood of Messiah Yeshua, we are now able to perceive and understand the need for the Torah, the need for the instructions so that we can become legitimate children in the kingdom and inherit that which the Father has destined for us through His Son, Yeshua. I hope this is making sense to you. So like I said, each one of these covenants represents a period of time. Throughout all of this that I taught in the covenants, I also explained that each covenant is interdependent on each other, meaning you need to walk in each one. You cannot become a person that walks in the Torah if you are not saved, because the Torah is not for the profane, it is for those who are striving to be holy. It is for those that are saved, those who have now entered into the family of Israel. That's what it's about, and we need to understand that. You see, you cannot follow the Torah or apply it in your life effectively if you are not saved. Let me say that again. You cannot follow the Torah, the instructions found in the Torah. Neither can you apply it to your life effectively if you are not saved. Just the same as you cannot expect to become a legitimate child if you never learn what the house rules are. In other words, if you never study what the Torah means, if you never in inquire about the instructions you will never know what, how to live in Yahweh's family. You see, we don't forget about the Torah once we step into the third covenant, which is all about inheritance. Rather, what actually is supposed to happen is we're supposed to apply all we've learned from the time of salvation through into the inheritance as we grow up as Messiah desired us to be, becoming perfect, tamim. Remember that word. If there's one word that you need to always remember, it's tamim. Tamim means without spot or blemish, a true reflection of Messiah Yeshua himself. And in order for us to become the bride that is without spot and blemish, we need to apply every single principle found in each one of these covenants. Now, brothers and sisters, with that as an overview, I'd like us to take a deeper look at the third covenant the covenant of inheritance. I believe that the covenant of inheritance is the time period that you and I found ourselves in right now. It is the covenant of inheritance that we are living in right now, the time of the Davidic kingdom, the time of priests and kings. You know, for a long time, I thought I understood all that I needed. But Yeshua has been opening my eyes to new truth and to a deeper understanding of what this covenant is truly all about and what it actually means for you and I today. 
Now, like I said, growing in Messiah Yeshua and becoming a true child of His, it's all dependent on you and you alone. You choose how much you want to walk, how far you want to progress in this walk. You see, you alone can choose how far you want to go in your relationship with Yeshua. It's up to you. And for some of you, your current place is where you will remain. Unfortunately, because people have a hard heart. And the reasons why many people serve the king is actually based on their hard attitude, not on true devotion to his will and his desires. Now getting back to Genesis chapter 15. In Genesis chapter 15, it's where Abba Father says to Abram that he is his shield. Now shield means what? Your protection as well as his exceedingly great reward, which signifies what? Inheritance. So really this should cause us to, to think what is going on here. What is it that the father is trying to say to Abraham? Abram, because remember, his name hasn't changed yet. And Abram replies and he says to Yahweh, what could he give him as he still has no heir? There is no one to carry on his name and no one to pass that inheritance to. And it's here that we read that Yahweh gives Abram a promise of an heir from where? From his own loins. And Yahweh then also makes a blood covenant with Abram, signifying what? Salvation, signifying this newness of life. And he says that his descendants will inherit the land. A promise is given to his descendant. Let's read it again in, in, in Bereshit chapter 15, Genesis chapter 15, verse 1 onwards. And it says, And after these events, the word of Yahweh came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Yahweh himself is his protector. Your reward is exceedingly great. Or as the King James Version said, your reward is Yahweh. He shall be his exceedingly great reward. And Abraham said, Master Yahweh, what would you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abraham said, See, you have given me no seed, and see, one born in my house is my heir. And see, the word of Yahweh came to him, saying, This one is not your heir, but he who comes from your own body is your heir. That's what it says. And then it goes on in verse 5. And unfortunately, I haven't been able to put it on the slides. I apologize for that. But in verse 5, it says, And he brought him outside and said, Look now towards the heavens and count the stars if you are able to count them. And he said to him, So are your seed. Isn't that just awesome? And he believed in Yahweh and he reckoned it to him for what? For righteousness. And he said to him, I am Yahweh who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land. Why? To inherit it as your inheritance. You see, what we need to understand here is that Abraham had not yet had his name changed. As I said, Abraham is a servant of Yahweh and he's in the first covenant. Go and listen to covenants to understand this. You see, Abba Father says to Abram that if he walks before him and obeys him, he will protect him and that his reward will not be anything of this world, but his reward will be Yahweh himself. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that that is his inheritance? His inheritance is an intimate relationship with Yahweh. And he gets to inherit the land. You see, in essence, he's saying to him that his inheritance will be Yahweh. And that Abba Father himself will protect and keep him through every single situation. You know, we need to understand that this is not yet where Abraham is called a friend of Yahweh. And now you might say, but why is that important? Because it's giving us a type of picture of our own lives. You see, you and I, we too have entered in a blood covenant. I believe that many of you listening to this teaching, you are saved. We have entered into a blood covenant with Messiah Yeshua. You see, when we accepted Yeshua... That's when we entered in to a blood covenant with him. And I believe that just as Yahweh said to Abram that he is not to be afraid because he himself, Abba Father himself, is his shield and his reward. So to Yeshua says those words, I believe, to us when we get saved. He becomes our protection. He becomes the one that looks after us. He becomes our shield and he guards our lives. If we remain in him, he will remain in us. That's what we need to understand. You see, he wants us to know, like I said, that if we remain in him, if we remain in Yeshua and walk in his truth, in his instructions, that he will protect us. 
And we will become the children he wants us to become. Actually, we will become mature sons and daughters. We will become the reflection of the one who redeemed us. We will become that reflection of Messiah Yeshua. You know, too often believers get taught that once they're saved, everything is automatically given to you. You know, truthfully, you now have a right, I believe, to get those things. But we need to learn how to walk in the ways of Elohim. And that is a lifelong journey. That is why throughout the scriptures we read about great men of faith. And the scriptures say that they walked with Yahweh. It means a time of, of, of walking means what? It's a process. They didn't run with Him. They walked with Him. They grew in their faith. Brothers and sisters, we cannot remain a baby. You cannot remain a baby, always drinking the milk of the word and thinking that we will automatically become sons and daughters of righteousness if we do not mature in our faith. Rab Shul says it continually that we are not to be of those who continue to stay on the milk of the word. We are to be growing and maturing, becoming more like Yeshua. Now take note of what verse 6 says. It says that because Abram believed, it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Brothers and sisters, this is the same righteousness that I believe was reckoned to Lot. Remember the scriptures say that Lot was a righteous man, yet Lot messed up his life. And we've spoken about this in previous teachings. You see, this is the righteousness that comes to you when you or I believe in the Messiah by our faith. And I believe that Lot, he knew about the one true Elohim. And he believed, but he didn't walk out his faith into perfection. You see, brothers and sisters, to just believe in Messiah by your faith, this is not to be the be-all and end-all of our walk. You see, if you remember Lot, you will know that Lot was righteous in his generation, but he was not blameless. He was not Tamim. He was not perfect. He did not desire to grow in his walk. The fact of the matter is that Lot never chose to mature and thereby he never chose to become a legitimate child, a child of obedience, a child that ran away from the things that were wicked. Rather, he chose to remain a believer, but never a disciple. You see, there's a big difference, brothers and sisters, between just being a believer and one that actually becomes a true disciple that reflects Messiah Yeshua in all that they do. A righteous person, but also a Tamim person. You see, when we read on in Genesis, we come to see that Yahweh appears to Abram at different times in his life. And each time, something special happens. Let's take a look at Genesis, Bereshit, chapter 17. And it says the following. It says, And it came to be when Abram was 99 years old. Can you imagine that? 99 years old. That Yahweh appeared to Abram and said to him, I am El Shaddai. Walk before me. There you see it. He's not saying, hey, you know what, run with me. He's saying, walk before me. Walk before me. Mature. Get to be in an intimate relationship with me and be perfect. Walk with me. And as you walk with me in obedience, you will mature and you will become Tamim. And then he goes on and he says, And I give my covenant between me and you and shall greatly increase you. And Abraham fell on his face and Elohim spoke with him saying, as for me, look, my covenant is with you, and you shall become a father of many nations. And no longer is your name called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, because I shall make you a father of many nations. For I shall make you bear fruit exceedingly, and make nations of you. And sovereigns shall come from you. And I shall establish my covenant between me and you, and your seed after you in their generations. For an everlasting covenant to be Elohim to you, and your seed after you. You see, the Bible speaks, brothers and sisters, as we all know. We all sing that song. I am a friend of God. I'm sure we sing that song. We've sang it before somewhere. But you know, the Bible speaks of Abraham as a friend as well as a servant of Elohim. Again, why is this important to us? You see, what we need to come to understand is that the first time we saw Yahweh speak to Abraham before he had his name changed, and he comes to him to tell him who he can become. Not who he is, but who he can become. And he says that he will protect him and that he will be his exceedingly great reward. Then the second time we read that Yahweh tells Abram to walk before him and to be perfect, to be Tamim. 
You see, we have discussed this word many times. Tamim, or to be perfect, means to be spiritually mature, to grow up, to become a person who is spiritually mature. You see, brothers and sisters, Yahweh is showing Abraham how to become a man of inheritance, how to mature into all of the covenants, how to be an overcomer, how to be a man through whom his power and his presence can be revealed to a dying generation. You know, brothers and sisters, for many of you listening to this teaching, you have not, not, not yet come to understand the core meaning of why you serve Yeshua. You know, for a long time in my own life, I struggled. I really did. I struggled to understand why I do what I do. And for years, I would teach thinking it was to help people. And the truth is, indeed, I did help many people. I believe I did. But I always felt empty, like I was missing something. Something just never seemed to click. And it was only when I began to do the teaching on the faithful few that I began to realize who I am and why I should be doing anything in this life. You see, brothers and sisters, we have been called to be priests in the order of Melchizedek. And many people will speak about this, and there's many people today that are speaking about it. But they are never really teaching the truth, and they are never really truly coming to a full understanding of what it means. Because they are not willing to lay all of their will, their own selfish, soulful self down, and pick up the will of Messiah Yeshua. There are many people today that are still trying to find meaning, meaning to things, meaning in people, in places, and in Torah groups where there is no spirit. You see, brothers and sisters, the truth is that you will always be wandering around without purpose or meaning. And your efforts will be just that, your efforts. Until you stop, we need to stop and allow Yeshua to reveal and to show us what He really wants for our lives. What's actually inside of my heart? Why do I do what I do? What does it really mean to be a priest in the order of Melchizedek? What does that mean for me? Brothers and sisters, before we go on, I'd like to draw your attention to something that is of utmost importance to understand in this time and then to ask yourself at the end of it, what king do I represent? You know, a while back I got an email from a subscriber that really got me thinking about the condition of believers at present, at this present time in history. You know, in the book of Acts we read about the first Jerusalem council and about the fact that many Gentiles were getting saved. And it was at this point that Yaakov, James, stood up and said the words of Amos again. And it's these words that really have such a prophetic picture for this generation that you and I are alive in. Yet we're still missing it. And I pray in the name of Yeshua that as you listen to this teaching that you will get a deeper, more clearer understanding of what the Father wants from you and I. In Acts chapter 15, reading from verse 13 onwards, it says the following. And after they were silent, Jacob answered, saying, Men, brothers, listen to me. Shimon has declared how Elohim first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And the words of the prophets agree with this, as it has been written. After this I shall return and rebuild the booth of David, which has fallen down. And I shall rebuild its ruins, and I shall set it up, so that the remnant, there's that awesome word, remnant of mankind, shall seek Yahweh, even all the Gentiles on whom my name has been called, says Yahweh, who is doing all of this, who has made this known from of old. You know, it's always been the will, brothers and sisters, of Abba Father to restore the fallen booth of David. You know, a man who was a king and a priest, a man who desired more than anything else to have the very presence of Yahweh for all Israel to be able to see as well as experience. And he set up a way of worship that cannot be compared, I believe, to anything that we could do today. And we have spoken about this so much. And David set a way of worship up 24-7, seven days a week. And he stationed Levites to worship before the very ark of Yahweh. You see, brothers and sisters, what is so interesting about David is that he was a king who sought the presence of Yahweh. Yes, he had so many shortcomings, but one of the things that he did is he sought the presence of Yahweh and he desired to have an intimacy as well as a communion with Abba Father. 
Yet when we contrast his life with the man who desired to kill him, we come to see something very interesting. And I believe that we are at a breaking point. Just as Abba Father raised up new leaders out of the church to lead his people further, so he's doing the same thing today. There is a refined message being proclaimed, yet there is still a soul attitude that is taking place from the lives of many who teach this royal priesthood message. You see, they seem to believe that they have some superior knowledge that they alone have. And they teach the message, but they lack to lead the people into true repentance, a true breaking down of the soulful, willful hearts. A true repentance that leads to having a changed heart. You know, these leaders are not willing to lay it all down themselves. They are not willing to lay it all down themselves for the presence of the king to fall on the people. That is what will change lives. Not our magnificent teaching, but the presence of Yahweh will change lives. Unfortunately today, we still have teachers that simply revel in the praises of people. Yet at the same time, those that follow them are of those that are just like King Saul. You see, Saul struggled to have an intimate relationship with Yahweh. He relied in Samuel all his life, right up until his death. And you know, many today are just like that. They left the church, yet they yoked themselves to teachers. Teachers, brothers and sisters, that tickle their ears and teach them the things that make them feel good on the inside, but it doesn't change their heart. Why? Because these teachers are not making lasting disciples. Disciples that are able to enter the holy place. People who are able to stand in the presence of the king and worship there for longer than 30 minutes. Unfortunately today, there are many that are not making people disciples who are ready to carry the weight of the Father's glory in a generation of decay. If we are to be priests of righteousness, what does that mean? It means that we are to be the restorers of the presence of our king on this earth. Instead, we have people that are making followers and getting likes on social media that in the end means absolutely nothing. Brothers and sisters, we are living in a generation where the righteous, the Bible says it in the book of Daniel, it says that the true sadiks, the true righteous, they will shine like the sun. And that these people, these true sons and daughters of righteousness, that through the works that they do for their king, they will lead many to the truth. Why? Why? Why will this happen? I believe because they are led by the master. They are led by the king of kings, by Messiah Yeshua himself, and they hear his voice. This is exactly what it says about the faithful few. The final remnant, the 144,000, call them what you want. Because what does the word say? It says that they follow the Lamb. They follow Yeshua wherever He goes. Why? Because they chose to be a David instead of a Saul. They chose to seek out the presence of Messiah Yeshua for themselves. And it cost them something. Whereas you have others that seek out teachers all over the internet, people that make them feel good. They are not willing to seek out the depth of Yahweh's scriptures themselves, the depth of an intimate relationship. Instead, they get others to do it for them. Brothers and sisters, we need to get into position and we need to be people who have the ears to hear. Brothers and sisters, I say this with the most respect and love. Wake up, people of Yahweh. It doesn't say those who keep the Torah will overcome. It says those who have have the ears to hear. Those that actually obey what the Torah says. You can be keeping the Torah till you're blue in the face, but you're not walking in obedience and you're not willing to repent. You see, the Torah alone will not get you into the position that Abba wants you to be in this generation. He's looking for those who have obeyed the Torah, the instructions as a lifestyle. And thereby have applied it to their lives and have matured into a son and daughter through whom he is now able to reveal his glory. A son and daughter that is ready to take hold of what he has for their lives. I've been saying that this period of time that we're in is the time of inheritance. It's the time of the sons and daughters. 
The question that we need to answer is what then do we inherit? Do we inherit a kingdom? Do we inherit a crown, power, or a new life? What is it that Yeshua is wanting to teach us while we are still here on this earth? You see, we need to understand that the inheritance covenant comes before the final covenant of marriage, the bridal covenant. You see, before we can be married to our king, we need to learn to live as his bride here on earth. It's a training ground. We need to learn to live for him in the realm of a king and a priest. We've been so defeated because we have never truly had an encounter with Yeshua that has revealed our worth to us. And brothers and sisters, I'm starting to see this more and more. People are hungry. People are hungry for an encounter with a king. They are, they are hungry for a true encounter that changes them so that they can come to understand the true worth of their lives. When will we come to him with the faith like a child so that we can have a true encounter with him as a son or a daughter? When will we just come and sit on his lap and receive what he wants to give us? You know, the problem why we struggle with this is because in the church it was all about Yeshua and only salvation. Then in the Torah we learned all about his instructions and what we needed to be doing with them. But all this was always meant to be so that we would be reconciled to who? To Papa, to Abba Father, to Yahweh Himself. It's all got to do with the fact that He wants us to be in a love relationship with Him like it was in the Garden of Eden. So that you and I might come to understand in this life who we truly are, when we fully understand who we truly are, do you know what a force we will be against the enemy? He wants you and I to be legitimate, legitimate heirs of that inheritance. True children that know His love and operate in His power. Now in 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 24 to 29, we read a story about David. And I've spoken about this story often. And I'd like to touch on this in part one. And then in part two, we're going to dig a little bit deeper. And we're going to go further with the rest of the teaching. But in part one, I'd like to touch on 2 Samuel chapter 15, 24 to 29. And we read a story about David and the sons of Zadok. And I believe that this story holds great truth for us today. You see, when we put the pieces together and we allow the Ruach to speak to us so that we fully understand His Word, that is when our hearts and our minds get open and we receive. Now let us try and put the pieces together. Now, I have taught on this before, but I feel it is very important that so often we, we just skim over things and it's good to go back to things and look deeper into it and get a fuller understanding. Now we first need to understand who the sons of Zadok are and their spiritual as well as their prophetic significance. Now we need to understand that he was one of those who came to David in Ziklag. Now it says the following in 1 Chronicles chapter 12 verse 1 and 22 verse 28. It says, Now these are the ones who came to David in Ziklag, while he was still restricted because of Saul, the son of Kish. For day by day men came to David to help him until there was a great army like the army of Elohim. Also Zadok, a young man, mighty of valor, and of his father's house, 22 captains. Now, there is so much prophetic significance in this one passage, of, in this one verse, that it blows my mind away. When we look at it, we need to understand that in this final generation, brothers and sisters, there are going to be those, as we have spoken about, the righteous, the remnant, who will, who will join themselves to David, who is a type of Messiah figure. And in the end, there will be a great army, a true army army of spirit-filled warriors, people who will overcome for their king. So we know that Zadok and his entire house rejected Saul and gave their hearts and allegiance to David. Their hearts and allegiance to David. David being who? A type of Messiah figure. Not once did he ever look back. You see, brothers and sisters, we need to make a decision today. Whom are we going to serve? Are we going to serve man or are we going to serve Yeshua? Are we going to give everything that we are to Him? And the Bible says that He proved to be righteous because He proved to be faithful. You see, brothers and sisters, obedience and faithfulness go hand in hand. We need to walk in by faith, but we need to listen and do in obedience. And when we do that, 
We prove our worth. We prove who we really are. Whose son are we? Whose daughter are we? Are we, are we the children of righteousness? Are we the children of light? Now getting back to the story, the Bible tells us that he was there when David needed him. And when so many others were being carried away by the rebellion of Absalom, Zadok remained faithful through it all. Brothers and sisters, in this final generation, as the anti-Messiah rises up, as the world powers rise up, there are going to be many that are going to fall away from the faith. Why? Because the message that was proclaimed from the pulpits was not the message that is going to be lived out upon this earth. People are waiting to be taken out instead of waiting to go through and to be redeemed and to overcome. We need to be people who have eyes to see. We need to understand the message. Let's go on in 2 Samuel chapter 15, 23 and onwards. It reads the following. It says, The king also passed over the, bro- the brook Kidron, and all the people passed over towards the way of the wilderness. Now behold, Zadok also came, and all the Levites with him, carrying the ark of the covenant of Elohim. And the king said to Zadok, Return the ark of Yahweh to the city. The king said also to Zadok the priest. Now this is where it gets interesting. Are you not a seer? Return to the city in peace and your two sons with you your son abimaz and jonathan the son of abithar see i'm going to wait at the fords of the wilderness until word comes from you to inform me now brothers and sisters i want you to read this again you see we need to understand when we read things in the scripture there is a very very important prophetic message that has been given to us through the life of david and through the sons of zadok he says to him are you not a seer You see, this man, Zadok, I believe, you have the gift of discernment. You are able to see. You know what is evil and you know what is holy. You know the difference between the holy and the profane. You are strong enough as well as faithful and committed enough to me to go into that realm of rebellion, to go back to the place where there is destruction, where where there is mayhem and chaos. So that why? So that you can save the kingdom. Brothers and sisters, if you understand the message of the final remnant, that's exactly what Yeshua is saying. They will be strong enough. They will be filled with His power and His ruach. They will be filled with discernment to be able to go back and to do the works of Yeshua in this generation. That is what the entire message is in this generation. We need to be of those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. That's exactly what is happening in this passage of Scripture. Return to the city in peace and your two sons with you. It's so, so important to understand this. So the king says to Zadok, return to the city. Elohim now had a holy priest to guard the house from ruin. And and this is where it gets very interesting. You see, brothers and sisters, we need to understand. So many people today are preaching the message of the Melchizedek, but they're not understanding what that message is all about. To be a priest in the order of righteousness means that you stand up for injustice and you stand up for Yahweh's, you stand against injustice and you stand up for Yahweh's righteousness. And you are one who is in communion with Him on a daily basis so that the presence of Yahweh can come into a place, so that we become the protectors of His presence. The world has no idea of who Yahweh is. The presence of Yahweh has departed. It is through His royal priesthood, through His sons and daughters of righteousness, that the glory, the manifest presence of Yahweh is to be revealed again in this generation. That's what it means. He is looking for a son and daughter who will go back and guard, guard Yahweh's house, guard Yahweh's presence from ruin. You see, a whole nation at this time in the story that we're reading, a whole nation was in rebellion. But in Yahweh's house, there was a holy remnant. This is exactly what we've been teaching. You see, the whole world, brothers and sisters, is in rebellion. Isaiah says it. It says, thick darkness covers the earth and darkness is over the people. But Yahweh's glory, His power, His presence shall rise upon the righteous, upon those who walk in integrity. Psalm 15. Man, isn't this just awesome? Firstly, take note of what has been said here. This is in a time, brothers and sisters, where this story is playing out. In a time of great rebellion in the kingdom. The kingdom is in turmoil. And Absalom, which is a type and foreshadow of the anti-Messiah, he is trying to take the kingdom for himself. He is trying to subdue it. He is trying to rip it away from David, who is a type of Messiah figure. 
But it's during this time that Zadok, a righteous man, he remains faithful to the one true appointed king. He remains faithful to who? To David. Isn't that exactly the same picture that we see with the final remnant, the 144,000, those who remain faithful to Yeshua in a time of great distress? Again, like I said, we would do well to remember that David is a type of Messiah. So the, the, the thing that we need to understand is that this story is just filled with truth for us. You see, Zadok remains faithful to David. And this brethren, as I said, is a picture of the faithful remnant that will be upon the earth in the final days before the return of Messiah. And I believe that Messiah Yeshua at this time is, is sending out people. He is raising up this remnant. He is preparing them for what is to take place. It's very, very important. You see, the days of the anti-Messiah were those that who said, or those who, there's going to come a time, brothers and sisters, let's be honest. There's going to come a time where the anti-Messiah will be upon this earth. And those who said that they are true children of Yeshua, because they didn't have a love for the truth, because they didn't have an intimate relationship with Messiah Yeshua, they will fall away from the faith. They will partake in the spirit of the age, the harlot, and the Bible says because they did this, they will be judged accordingly. They will be judged accordingly. I want you to understand the story here. And I have said so many times, please read and study the Faithful Few series and study all of the, of the teachings that is found under the final remnant. Please, just when you have time, there is so much that, that can be found and so much to understand. You see, the message in those teachings is one of true gold, I believe. Not because I did a teaching, no. It's because Yeshua's message to his body is one of great truth. And I believe that it lays the foundation to what Yeshua will be building on in the days to come. And we know that from the days of Eli the priest and his sons, that Yahweh was unpleased with the priesthood. We know this. He was so angry that he removed his presence from the temple. Let's read what it says in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 27. It says the following. Then a man of Elohim came to Eli and said to him, This says Yahweh, Why do you kick at my sacrifice and at my offering which I have commanded in my dwelling and honor your sons above me? We know that his sons were wicked by making yourselves fat to the choicest of every offering of my people Israel. Behold, the days are coming when I will break your strength and the strength of your father's house so that there will not be an old man in your house and you will see the distress of my dwelling in spite of all that I do good for Israel and an old man will not be in your house forever yet I will not cut off every man of yours from my altar that your eyes may fail from weeping and your soul grieve and all the increase of your house will die in the prime of life but I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart and in my soul and I will build him an enduring house and he will walk before my anointed always brothers and sisters you see what we need to understand is that the sons of Zadok are that priesthood. It is this priesthood that is a picture of the Melchizedek priesthood. And it shows us how we are to serve Yeshua. You see, in a time of great distress, these priests, these sons of Zadok, they remain faithful to David, a type of Yeshua. But not only did they remain faithful to David, they went about protecting the ark. The ark is the very presence of Yahweh. They didn't go about doing anything else. It wasn't about some doctrinal teaching that they had to preserve or some idea of man or anything else. No, they protected the very presence of Yahweh. And if we, if we need to understand this, we need to put it into perspective. You see, the true priesthood today of Yeshua, the true sons and daughters of righteousness, they will do everything they can to protect the presence of the King within the assembly of Messiah Yeshua. Even if that means rebuking and calling out sin. Why? So that the presence can return, just like Pinchas. Today, the so-called priesthood is happier to convince the masses that their doctrine is right, that what they teach is the right one. Because why? They have all the answers, yet you cannot help but notice that the fire of Abba Father is missing. The very presence of Yeshua that changes lives in the assembly of Messiah Yeshua in the body and sets the captives free is nowhere to be found. Nowhere to be found. Because the keepers of the presence, the true priesthood is missing.
Brethren, I believe this is the final remnant. This is those that mature and have truly God in it. They understand it. I have no other way of putting it. The holy remnant, a faithful priesthood of today, these servants of Yahweh that will serve Yahweh and not man. They will be of those who have hearts that are blameless and faithful. They will strive to do the things that Yeshua wants. I believe that these kind of people are the true offspring of Zadok in a spiritual sense. They are the spiritual sons of Zadok. They are the ones who have come to realize that it's not about them. It will never be about us, brothers and sisters. We cannot steal the glory for ourselves. No matter how well you sing or dance or speak, it's not for us. It's all for His glory. It's all about Him. You see, the true priesthood will not have a great following. They will be instead the ones who are more interested in maintaining the presence of the King and building up the faithful, righteous remnant. The question that we need to ask ourselves is, what does it take to become a priest like this? You see, what needs to be noted is that these priests minister to Yahweh. That is their primary purpose. Their purpose is to minister to Yahweh. Not to be interested about people. They will minister to people, yes. But their primary purpose is to in, in entertain the presence of Yahweh, to be in His presence, to serve Him first. Brethren, are you seeing the connection now? I hope that you're beginning to understand the entire message of Yeshua the past few months. You see, to be able to minister in the Holy of Holies means that you have died to self. It's not about you anymore. It's all about Him. You've come to understand why you do what you do. Yeshua is looking for priests in the order of righteousness. But still many don't really know what that word means. To be in the order of Melchizedek means that you are willing to live just like the King of Righteousness. The picture of this is seen, brothers and sisters, I believe, in the faithful priests of Zadok, as well as in the final remnant, the 144,000. Go and read it in the book of Revelation. It says that they are willing to die for their faith. You see, our purpose is to conform to the image of Yeshua, to die to self and to be willing to live for Him in everything that we do to reveal Messiah Yeshua to our friends, our family, our work colleagues, to the entire nation and world. That's who he's looking for. Brothers and sisters, when we come back for part two, we're going to dig further into the story of Zadok and we're going to look deeper into it. And then we're also going to touch again on Caleb and Joshua and we're going to talk about that too, as well as talk about Peter and his life. And we're going to come to understand what kind of people Yeshua is looking for in this generation. And I pray in the name of Yeshua that this teaching is spoken to your heart and not just your head. That it will dig far deep down in your heart. That the roots will take root and that you will come to understand that before you can do anything, we are to be holy as Yahweh is holy. That He is looking for a son and daughter that is willing to mature. Forget about the people and serve Him with all your heart all your mind and all your soul. Not because of what you can get, but because of your love for Him. Then He will be your exceedingly great reward and He will be your shield and He will be your protector. He will look after you and He will keep you and He will bless you. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Yeshua Mashiach and we thank you, Father, that you are raising up a righteous, faithful remnant, a people who have ears to hear and eyes to see, a people, Father, that will serve you in spirit and in truth. And Father, I believe in this generation we are going to see awesome, awesome things, great works of righteousness, great works, just like Yeshua came and He healed the sick. Father, I believe that we are going to see the same things happening at a greater scale in this generation. Father Yahweh, I pray that every single person that has listened to this teaching, Father, that they will examine themselves to test and see if they are in the faith. Father, to allow your word to resonate in their hearts, not to seek out teachers that tickle the ears, but Father, to be people who seek your presence, the keepers of your presence. People, Father, that through their lives, because of the lives and the hearts that they have, that you will want to make your dwelling place with them so that they may grow, that they may mature, and that the world may come to know you and the power of your presence through their lives. 
Father Yahweh, we bless you for this time. We thank you, Father, for every opportunity that we have to share your word. And we give you praise in the wonderful name of Yeshua Mashiach. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I thank you for joining me. And I pray that you will come back and listen to part two that we will do. And we'll put it out um, probably next week sometime. I pray that part two will bless you, that it will speak to your heart. I'd also like to invite you to head over to our website at www.treasuredinheritanceministry.com where you can get more teachings. We do a coffee break live, uh, my, my wife and myself, every Sunday, a podcast, radio broadcast, and every single one of those teachings or those coffee breaks are uploaded to our website. We do not put them on YouTube, so you're missing out if you've only been subscribed here on YouTube. Please subscribe to the website too so that you can become a member and get all those teachings and really just enjoy what the Father has put out there and allowed us to put onto the website. I'd also like to invite you to subscribe to this channel if you haven't yet. Please subscribe, share these teachings far and wide, and we hope to see you back, as I said, for part two. Be blessed in Messiah Yeshua's name. Amen.